Good morning and welcome to Rising. We've got a great show for you today. It's going to be a very long Tuesday because we have the vice presidential debate this hey. evening. So hey, we Olympics. have to remain alert and focused and awake and uh, sober uh, in order to watch it. So Speak for yourself. <laughs> that will be a lot of fun. But CBS is going to be experimenting with a new way to do live fact-checking during tonight's debate in New York City between Ohio Senator J.D. Vance and Governor of Minnesota Tim Walz. And it's maybe just a little bit foolish, in my opinion. A QR code will appear on screen for long stretches of the VP debate. That's right, a QR code, those annoying things you have to point your phone's camera at, hoping it works, and scan the code. Now, when viewers scan the code this time, they'll be directed to the CBS News website, where about 20 CBS journalists will post fact checks of the candidates' comments in real time. I assume that anyone watching who wants to know what CBS journalists have to say about the debate can cut out the middleman and find their way to CBS.com without the help of a QR code. Now, CBS has said the moderators, Nora O'Donnell and Margaret Brennan, will focus on encouraging exchanges between the candidates and enforcing ground rules rather than doing the fact-checking themselves. I think that's good. The new move comes after many, including me, criticized the ABC moderators for injecting far too much, interjecting far too much when Trump spoke during the last debate, but not doing the same for Kamala Harris. Tonight's debate is set to last 90 minutes with no studio audience, microphones left on throughout the event. Stakes are big for Vance and Walls, as this is the final debate on the 2024 schedule. There is no plans for Trump and Harris to debate again. Vance and Walls will both aim to paint the other as too extreme for the American people. Politico writes that Vance is expected to attack Walls on his far-left agenda, including his disastrous record on border security, being soft on crime, failures as Minnesota governor, including his handling of the Minneapolis riots, following the killing of George Floyd, while Walls is expected to focus many of his attacks on Trump. Hot-button issues for the two, two candidates will likely include Harris's flip-flops, the Springfield, Ohio saga, and Vance's past remarks about Trump. Meanwhile, the New York Times editorial board has just thrown their endorsement behind Vice President Kamala Harris. The editorial board's powerful headline reads, quote, the only patriotic choice for president. And in the first paragraph, the board came out swinging, writing, quote, it is hard to imagine a candidate more unworthy to serve as president of the United States than Donald Trump. He has proven himself morally unfit for, for an office that asks its occupant to put the good of the nation above self-interest. He has proved himself temperamentally unfit for a role that requires the very qualities, wisdom, honesty, empathy, courage, restraint, humility, discipline that he most lacks. The, time goes on, the times go on to say that the fact that Trump is not fit to be president should be enough for any voter who cares about the health of our country and the stability of our democracy to deny him re-election. Mm. An unsurprising endorsement of Kamala Harris from the New York Times. I think that was probably one of the more expected endorsements of all time. But I thought they Fine. stopped doing endorsements. I thought they were going to... No, when did they, they stop oh, doing they endorsements? They announced in New York that they're no longer going to do endorsements. Um, oh, in the state of New York. In, in the IAF. But oh. I, I, I remember when they, just all around. they endorsed... Um, one of their funnier endorsements was in 2020... They endorsed in the Democratic primary. Who did they? They endorsed, I believe, Amy Klobuchar and okay. Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Like a dual endorsement of just those two yeah. people, um, two people who did not fare agree particularly on, well. Yeah, well, uh, no, they agree abortion. on, I think they agree on some things. Uh, so, some I think of them both as kind of antitrust, classic FDR, Dem type people. I mean, you know more than I do. I feel do. like I Amy Klobuchar was a little bit more conservative. They wanted both sides. They well, she was more have... conservative on, like, <laughs> right, she was denied the VP slot because she was maybe slightly to the right on like whether there should be police, which was a <laughs> which was an embarrassing thing to to think, I guess, as a Democrat at the time, or so the mainstream media thought. Even though most people, including most Democrats, were never fully on board with the whole, in my view, she um, also, that whole wave of classically neoliberal. But she also, don't forget, had some issues with her staff where she was throwing things at them and. They were quitting. The salad forks, yeah. Yeah, it was not a it was not a good look for a vice presidential pick. You want to go if you say so. Yeah. Um, anyway, I uh, things that annoy me, top of the list. Let's hear QR it. QR codes. Okay. Yes. Hate them. Thank you. Hate them. We can find commonality oh, on that. Definitely. They're the, I love that they, for years, they've been saying, "Oh, this is going to catch on like wild. Everybody's going to love them. We, we have them all over Asia." 
not in America. No, we we don't need this. It's it takes longer to make it. I hate when this comes up on um, when you're trying to log into something on the TV oh and they're like, you can scan a QR code and it'd be easier to do it. No, it's not. Just let me do it here. Yeah. I don't want to do another device. I, I'm sorry. This is cranky old man corner right now, are. but uh, it's the menus, uh, very obnoxious. That's the one that drives me crazy. Oh God. The menus. I want a menu. Give me a printed menu. I know you. No one wants to pay for it anymore, but. I even want pictures on my menus. I know it's very controversial. No, but go off, queen. I really want pictures. You can make them fancy. They don't have to be like, you know, the old-fashioned, like, crappy restaurants. There's, that a, no. th there's a restaurant near me uh, where I live um, that I otherwise like, and I, I won't say it because I don't want to, you know, get them, I don't know, to receive death threats or something. <laughs> Pizza game but, uh, they, number two. <laughs> they, for a while, they were doing, there were three QR codes for the drink menu the appetizer menu and the dinner menu. <laughs> like this is just this is just wrong. So anyway, like sorry. a ninety-five year old. Can you imagine? Every time you're with somebody who's a little older yeah. and not how does this thing work? Or if you're in another country and you don't have Wi Fi and so bad. It's it's So this is a long digression from the point, but the point <laughs> being that we don't need like people who want to hear how CBS feels about the remarks being made by the candidates, I think are already smart enough to just put CBS.com into their uh, their web browser or on their phone application and find it. Obviously, I guess it does no harm to put, out, put up a QR code, but I have a hard time believing that um, people are like, I'm, I'm so, how, how do I get more information? Oh, thank God, a QR code, like a, a shining light from on high. I don't think so. I think the other thing is the people who are going to go look for the fact checking probably are the people who check out, you know, whether or not someone's telling the yeah, truth. Yeah, they have a not. copy of the New York Times. They have, exactly. Sitting. But Andy. it drives traffic to CBS.com. Maybe. CBS.com, who we do not work for. Yeah, we do not. Go, go, go to our... So <laughs> I am glad, now. you're going to disagree with this, but I am glad that the moderators are not going to be doing the same kind of fact-checking that went on in the ABC debate. I thought it was too aggressive, and then it was blind to misstatements made by Kamala Harris. I know you will say that Donald Trump's volume of misstatements was higher, Fine, I, I, even if I concede that, I don't think it excuses that they didn't correct her the two or three times she said something that was just not, that was not factually accurate. Now, in my ideal world, they wouldn't really do that at all. They can just, they, maybe they ask the question again, but facilitate and prompt the candidates to do the fact checking because it should be a debate between the candidates. It's not an interview one-on-one -on -one between the journalist and the candidate. Now, when that happens, I like to see really strenuous grilling. You saw that at the last debate where they were, they were doing that as if that, that's what was going on. It was an interview of Donald Trump between David Muir and him and aggressive questioning. And then it, was, it felt like three on one to me, which you know a lot of conservative people were very understandably upset about. Well, those are the conservatives. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, if you're watching a debate and you still don't know who you're going to pick, Maybe a little pushback helps. This is also a different beast. J.D. Vance is not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is an anomaly. He is hard to contain. He mm -hmm. says whatever he wants. He makes things up on the spot, as we know. So does J.D. Vance, but just not at the same rate. And I, I do expect J.D. Vance to be a little bit more uh, respect, respectful of the moderators. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit more. We don't know. We haven't seen him. He's good at debate. I mean, he's, he's fluent in cable news. He's an attorney, of course. He went to Yale Law School. I think Tim Walls... I think he's great on TV, and I think he's very good off the cuff, but he has signaled that debates are not his strong hmm. suit, so... Uh, of the four people, Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, J.D. Vance, and Tim Walls, J.D. Vance is the one of the four who has done by far the most media this oh, cycle definitely. since becoming the vice president, since being foisted into this important role. He has been willing to be grilled relentlessly by mainstream media. Um, he is very practiced at it. He does a good job in those environments. Uh, so he, it's going to be a formidable challenge for Walls, I think. Um, and also, Walls is going to try to make it about Trump, because Trump is you know, the one with the record. I'm, J.D. Vance has, has a record as a senator, but Walls has a record as a governor, as you know, the chief executive of a state. So J.D. Vance can talk about those policies. You know, he talks specifically about, um, about the police stuff. I would like to see some of the COVID policies um, aired, because I strongly object to the COVID policies of Tim Walls. Um, I think that might be healthy, uh, healthy to remind people of, but it should be interesting. It should be interesting, and I, I think it's not just going to be about Trump, though. I do think they're going to bring up a lot about 
uh, J.D. Vance's, you know, questionable history. You know, he tries to to be the man that that he wrote about in his book, but this is a man who worked in Silicon Valley. He was an investor in Silicon Valley. He's heavily backed by Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is obviously a billionaire and very conservative leaning, and he wrote the foreword to Project 2025. So as much as the the Trump fans ticket wants to separate themselves from Project 2025, I have no doubt that. Mm. You're going to hear from Tim Walls over and over talking about the details of Project 2025 and latching J.D. Vance to that idea book of uh, this dystopian world that they somehow think Mm. the rest of the country wants to live in, Mm. the majority of the country. Well, you don't need a QR code to watch our show, thank goodness. We've got a lot more to come talking about on Rising right after this. Stay tuned. Georgia judge struck down the six-week abortion ban on Monday, allowing the procedure to be formed beyond that limit. The state's abortion law had gone into effect in 2022. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Robert McBurney wrote that the ban violated Georgia's constitution, state constitution, writing in his order, quote, liberty in Georgia includes in its meaning, in its protections, and in its bundle of rights, the power of a woman to control her own body, to decide what happens to it, and in it, and to reject state interference with her health care choices. Now, in contrast to the six-week ban, McBurney's ruling would allow abortions through at least 20 weeks of pregnancy. Georgia's pan- ban was part of a cadre of bans that went into effect after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, ending the national right to abortion. Thirteen states now ban or severely restrict the procedure at early stages of pregnancy, with some exceptions. Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr vowed to appeal McBurney's decision to the state Supreme Court. McBurney's order comes after two moms died in connection with the abortion restriction. His decision has been applauded. Writer Jessica Valenti posted, quote, A Georgia judge has struck down the state's six-week abortion ban. In an absolutely epic ruling, Fulton County Judge Robert McNerby didn't just repeal the law, but eviscerated it as forcing women to be, quote, human incubators. Aaron Reed tweeted, trans activist Aaron Reed tweeted, excuse me, uh, incredible news, Georgia's six-week abortion ban has been ruled unconstitutional under state law. Everybody deserves the right to bodily autonomy. Hmm. Yeah, look, I personally feel that six weeks is too early to have an abortion ban in place. Um, I would not be in favor of such a policy. Now, if the voters in a state or their representatives in a state legislature feel otherwise, um, I don't know that I'm, I wouldn't vote that way, but it's a democracy and the state gets to choose what the abortion policy is. Um, Something, you know, more along the lines of 15 weeks with some medical exceptions, um, depending on the circumstance, is more along the lines of what I support and I think where most Americans are. I think most Americans want um, abortion to be safe, legal, and rare, want um, other options to be available, want birth control to be more widely available so that people can make responsible choices for themselves and not end up in a situation where they even need an abortion. But yes, that it should be a valid um, option in some cases, uh, but we should really try to limit if we if, limit it via uh, ways other than forbidding it or, you know, m- making it criminal because that has all sorts of uh, bad side effects too. People still will seek the procedure. I understand that. And then have it done in unsafe um, settings. I, I take that seriously, but um, we should, we should try to find alternative uh, methods for people to have more control over their lives and their family planning Um, than abortion because it is an unpleasant procedure and many Americans, not a majority of them, but many of them feel like it is harming a human life, particularly as it goes on. I I think that argument, again, in the very early stages of the pregnancy is not so compelling, but by the end of a pregnancy, the entity inside you is basically indistinguishable from a human child and then I do think deserves certain protections. And and the reality is is that's almost, the majority of abortions or uh, medical care in some cases are because there's some sort of medical risk um, sure. to the mother, to the baby, to both. And that is essentially what this judge is saying is, you know, women cannot just be incubators. You have to give them bodily autonomy in, in many instances as these two mothers who died to protect themselves. Uh, if you have an ectopic pregnancy under a lot of these restrictive laws that are being, that have been passed in states, under an ectopic pregnancy, you, the, wo- the woman's life is at risk, and the baby's life it may not go on and most likely will not go on. So if you can't get an abortion in that kind of situation, that's ridiculous. That's actually oppressing women. So I commend this decision. Two-thirds of Georgia voters after Roe v. Wade uh, was repealed 
said that they were in favor of abortion in Roe v. Wade. So it does seem like the voters of Georgia do believe in this, and it's going to be at a 22-week uh, mark now, which is still, by the way, you still have abortion laws on the book. It's not like suddenly anybody can have an abortion whenever they want. It's just not as restrictive as the previous law was. And, you know, I commend them. And this is going to be a hot-button issue in this election. Kamala Harris is going state to state right now, campaigning um, on a bus tour, talking about what's at risk for women's lives. And as we know, women are, this isn't just a women's issue, but women are more likely to be pro-choice and they're more likely to turn up and vote. They're much more um, a significant voting population, not just the fact that there's more of them, but they're more reliable to vote. Yes, I should note that my understanding from talking with pro-life um, supporters, including uh, Amber, who's a host on the show, she, she says that you know, pro-life people do obviously believe that in, in the case of an ectopic pregnancy or a health risk to the, the I and mean, in some cases, in, as you say, in, in those cases, the, there's already a substantial risk to the, to the fetus as well, that then it, it should not, they're not trying to criminalize that. It's being interpreted that way by some doctors, I suppose, and is being made, they feel like they're at legal risk because of the state of the law. But pro-life people say they're not actually interested in banning that. Well, some pro-life people. There's all shades of pro-life, and I think many use different excuses to suit their narrative, especially in places like Texas, where uh, now the state can come after a doctor. And, and keep in mind, I mean, this could be a lawmaker who is making a claim against a doctor. So that's legal fees, um, you know, s potentially shutting down a clinic, uh, the license. I mean, there's so much more at stake when you have several of these laws on, on the books that go after really the, the ecosystem of supporting women's health. I mean, they also shut down women's health clinics in, in Texas and in other states like Arizona. You know, so now the women's health clinics that exist in, in some of these communities are religious, and they're not providing all the same services uh, that you would normally get when you go to a women's health clinic. So it's, it's ridiculous. It's a far right-wing um, agenda item, and it's deemed, it's, it's based in religion that does not represent the majority of this country's beliefs, does not represent the majority of people who, who abide by any faith's beliefs. It is an extremist view that has taken over many of our legislatures to, in my opinion, oppress women. Just as simple as that. Oh. I know that's not what you want to do. I'm just saying yeah, some I, folks are, are using this as an opportunity and will flip the narrative and come up with all these excuses. And at the end of the day, you know... They, not, I, I know a lot of uh, pro-life people and... In fact, I know some pro-life people who are not particularly religious. The argument is not, well, this is the, if this is just, I, I would obviously reject it if this was just the, you know, the belief system of a religion and that, you know, that should not be enshrined into law. But you can certainly, you can construct an argument, and again, the argument is that some rights belong to the, the preborn baby, the fetus, and you can't, you know, I, I, you can talk about bodily autonomy, but I don't have the right to use my bodily autonomy to um, engage in force or harm to another living entity. So it's really an argument over to what, what rights do we give to this, I keep using the word entity because I don't think it's a living, breathing human being, but it's also not just a clump of cells. Um, I mean, we give, again, there are these gray zones, right? We give children have some rights, but not as many rights as adults. Animals have some rights. You can't just go around murdering <laughs> Springfield or anywhere else, people's pets, uh, because we, like, we have protections for, we, pets can't vote. They don't have all the same rights as human beings, but they have some rights not to be like, you know, horrifically mutilated and injured. They're animal cruelty laws. So we, we do, as a society, determine, like, sorry, that violates your bodily autonomy, but there are some limits on what you are allowed to do. So I see it similarly to that. It's not a religious argument. It's just a, at, at, there's a place where there's a trade-off between your right to do this and the right of the being not to be harmed. Well, that's why, when I say religious, it is a lot of these religious groups, going back to the Christian coalition in the 80s, that were pushing for these really oppressive abortion laws because they had a different interpretation of when the fetus was, was life. I mean, if it was up to them, it would be the moment that the, the couple got in bed or whatever. I mean, well, it's no, either it the moment of, I mean, I have a bunch conception. of cells in Greece right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I froze my eggs. And that's wild. I mean, Greece is where I have my frozen eggs mm -hmm. is a culturally conservative religious country. And they don't even see it the way that J.D. Vance sees it. It's, it's wild to see how conservative our country has gotten, where even in more conservative countries around the world, uh, whether it's South America, you know, they're moving forward on these, these laws and these issues, including abortion, in many countries in South America, Catholic countries, and yet our country 
is going well, backwards. Most countries do prohibit abortion, though, after... Mexico they don't prohibit... They prohibit abortion, a, it, again, after the, like, 14 to 16-week mark, right? right? France has that policy. But, but that... Abortion is prohibited. You're right. You can, get, you can go in, get your excellent government health care, whatever that uh, progressives love in France. You can get your abortion up until, I think it's 15 weeks. And then you can't anymore. So they, they put they do put some limit on it. But this is okay. And I think that's fine. I think what, most people think that's fine. What France doesn't have is a lobby that is lobbying their lawmakers to just keep going, going, going. It's not that the majority of abortions. What, to keep going, going, going both ways, but, but right? We're majority, talking about 20 weeks now but in Georgia. The majority that's of abortions are not occurring after 15 weeks. And if they are, it's when the woman's life is at risk or the baby, both, both lives are at risk. That's what's happening after 15, 20 weeks. You know, it's, it's not in rape and incest. You know, these situations where, especially if you start shutting down clinics and the laws are more restrictive, it's going to take a longer period of time for some women to get abortions if they can't get appointments, as we heard during the DNC. People who, who try to get appointments, they, they first can't get an appointment at the clinic. It takes four weeks. Then they, the next appointment for an abortion is another four weeks later. And suddenly you're past the deadline. So this is all very complicated, but it is also very strategic. And that is what the far right is doing, is they're weaponizing different laws, you know, shutting off clinics, not, not funding them um, with the state legislatures, uh, making it so that the state can go after a doctor if they perform an abortion or a certain type of abortion after a certain period, um, making it so that they, you can't get to the clinics and set appointments up so that now it's past 15 weeks or 12 weeks or whatever, six weeks in the case of Georgia, which is ridiculous because many women don't even know they're pregnant at six weeks. Six I, just, we I agree. Six weeks is, is too soon, but after like 12 or 14 weeks, in my book, no questions asked up until that point. And then if you're still, but then after that, it should be a really exceptional case. It should involve a health risk or something like that. That will be my policy, and I think that's where the majority of the American people are. What and if that you can't is get an appointment? To other what if you can't get an appointment? I mean, that's what's happening. When you don't have clinics open, now... Well, I, right, I'm not for shutting down clinics or doing anything of the so, sort. Yeah, it's, we should, you should be able to get an appointment. I'm, I'm for, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm for people, again, offering this service in that time window, and it's not any of my business or the state's business, and that's fine. Well, there we go. We solved it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> complicated issue. A lot more coming up on Rising. Stay tuned for more right after this. We're always monitoring threats to free speech, and one of them could be former Microsoft CEO and co-founder Bill Gates. Billionaire suggested an artificial intelligence program that would ban harmful speech. We should have free speech, but if you're inciting violence, if you're causing people not to take vaccines, you know, where are those boundaries that even the U.S. Uh, should, you know, have rules? And then if you have rules, you know, what is it? Is there some AI that encodes those rules? Because you have billions of activity and, you know, if you catch it a day later, the harm is, is done. Gates published a seven-page paper on the future of AI last year, writing that developing artificial intelligence is, quote, as fundamental as the creation of the microprocessor, the personal computer, the internet, and the mobile phone. But he still has some reservations. On Monday, he voiced his concern, quote, that bad people with bad intent will use AI for cybercrime, bioterrorism, nation state wars. He also said he was concerned about the rate of change that could leave people without jobs and is also worried about the loss of control, including AI being used as a vehicle to spread misinformation. Speaking of misinformation, former United States Secretary of State John Kerry called the First Amendment a barrier to reaching the truth. Let's watch this. If people go to only one source and the source they go to is sick and, uh, you know, has an agenda and they're putting out disinformation, uh, our First Amendment stands as a major block to the ability to be able to just, you know, hammer it out of existence. So what you need, what we need is to, is to win the ground, win the right to govern by hopefully having, uh, you know, winning enough votes that you're free to be able to, to uh, implement change. I find those comments utterly odious. The First Amendment does not stop you from correcting wrongful information. The First Amendment makes sure that no single government authority gets to determine what is correct information. They can't be trusted to do so because our government lies to us, not just on 
the health-related or COVID-related issues, but about national security. People in our government made catastrophically bad decisions leading up to the Iraq War and many other examples of this. If they get to decide what's true or false, they can't be trusted to do so. Our, the framers of our Constitution, the people who invented the American system, in their wisdom, made sure that you would be able to contradict the government. And so we have this important protection, the First Amendment, that gets in the way of doing exactly what John Kerry just suggested. You're, you're correct on your thesis, right? Yes. 100%. But what John Kerry is not clarifying is that places like Twitter are not the news. They're a private corporation. They are not handled democratically. They don't have editors and fact checkers. So the way that we treat the media, which is also deeply flawed, and most mainstream media is tied to corporate interests and or uh, the national security state, and that is something that those there are some protections for news companies. And there's also some restrictions. They have to have more balance. That does not work in the case of Twitter and Facebook and a lot of these platforms, and definitely not with AI. Now, do I like that you know, Gates is, is, is going out there and inserting his opinion on policy? I don't love that, right? I mean, speaking of corporate interests. But he has the right, as an individual, to do so. And he is not saying you know, that he's going to crack down. He is saying, these are what I recommend for these reasons. And I agree with his reasons. But simultaneously, the pressure needs to be on lawmakers to take these tech companies into account. Like, they need to be held accountable for not having transparent algorithms, for having bot farms, for having, you know, not, uh, not clamping down on foreign disinformation campaigns that are being pushed, uh, for having an algorithm that skews, in the case of YouTube and some other platforms, uh, very far right and, and male towards young male individuals. Like, when I open up YouTube, I see makeup tutorials. I don't know how to put makeup on. I work in politics. All I do is watch political shows on YouTube. But I, as a woman, do not have the same experience as most men under 40 do. So that is not a town square. That is not democracy. So if you're building a base of communication off of something that is already skewed in one direction, sure, you can say whatever you want, but I'm not going to get the same attention as, you know, Joe Rogan does on, well, first off, he has a much bigger contract, but, but it's just... It's not skewed in similar directions, and so that's, well, that's my complaint. Uh, it's not, but it, it's, you know, as you alluded to, it's not required to be because it is a private company. If they tried to, if, if it was forced on them to be skewed, you might argue more fairly or whatever, that is exactly what would violate the First Amendment. The First Amendment doesn't say Twitter or YouTube has to be this place of pure neutrality or has to operate one way. What the First Amendment says is that the government could not take action to force it to be that way. So that's Unless it's not issues work. of national security, and that well, no, will... that's not an exception to the First Amendment. The exceptions are incitement to violence and libel and slander and those kinds of things, um, which, you know, I, it's fascinating, we didn't talk about this, how quickly Bill Gates goes from, you know, you can, there's not pure free speech, okay, we understand that, there are recognized by the Supreme Court exceptions to the First Amendment, incitement to violence is one of them, although it's a very narrow category where it's actual incitement to violence. And then he says, incitement to violence, Encouraging people not to take a vaccine. That's not incitement of violence. That's not prohibited under the First Amendment. You can you could make an argument. You are free to do that. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's right. But that is not that is not unprotected by the First Amendment so what whatsoever. If he's not attacking. I, I can't speak on behalf of Bill Gates, but just playing devil's advocate here. What if he's not attacking a person's right to say it, but a campaign, a, an, like a, a, a company that is pushing one narrative through fault. I mean, a bot isn't an individual. That's not a real person with rights to free speech or not. A Russian operation uh, is def definitely doesn't have the same rights as an American citizen does. So at what point, I mean, corporations are people, but are bots people? Well, I would say the right is not just on the speaker, right? The, the right is not a, in fact, the, the First Amendment is not a permission for the speaker. It's an infringement on the government for speech. Mm -hmm. And there's a speaker and there's a listener. So you say bots maybe don't have rights, but I, as the person consuming this content, engaging with and listening to this speech, I have a right to hear it if I want to. The government is restricted from doing anything to stop me from hearing that if I want to. It's not, it's not really a right for the speaker. It's an infringement on the government to prevent me from hearing the speech. So, you know, you, again, Russian disinformation, propaganda, whatever it is, I say that, that stuff's all bad. It's, yeah. it's bad speech. It's not good. It's bad policy. Russia is bad. But I have a right to engage with it as I want. In fact, I might want to talk about it. I might want to know what they're saying so I can correct it, so I can explain why I think it's wrong. They, I would still would say, even for obvious propaganda from foreign governments, that we have the right to consume that. And you know what? Sometimes 
there's a kernel of truth to it. Oftentimes they're weaponizing. I mean, they're weaponizing, uh, and that's really what John Kerry's trying to say, is they're weaponizing free speech. We have laws in this country that make America great, uh, but also sometimes those laws and those truths- I mean, free speech is a weapon. Are, it is a weapon, and, and for everybody. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we're doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're throwing bombs at each other, not, you yeah. know, quote. Right. Rhetorical bombs. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, <laughs> Is the system, so, so if the government can say to a broadcaster, you have to purchase a broadcasting license in order to be seen on the airwaves, and to be on those airwaves, you have to uh, show different sides. You can't just be one way, you know, one, one sided. And you have to, uh, you have to perform, you know, basic uh, workplace, you have to have equal opportunity employer because that's the way that we employ people in this country. That is a systemic issue that actually shapes the way that we hear the news, what information is being shared. So if Twitter does not operate the same way because they're not broadcasting and they're not press, um, you know, they can get away with whatever they want. So you're seeing mostly one-sided narratives. Well, I, I would say, first of all, some of those policies have gone out of existence and would not stand up to Supreme Court scrutiny now in terms of the um, you know, neutrality yeah. of the airwaves, that kind of, um, uh, 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 I'm forgetting what the name of the policy is right now, but the, the, well, yes, the one that required right. some kind of balance on the airwaves. Now, uh, licensing specifically for airwaves has to do with what the, the I'm not an, an expert on this category of the law or even this technology, but right, like the, the, there's only, so only one person can use this, or one company can use this airwave, this bandwidth at a time, so there had to be some um, licensing of it, given that it's it's um, it's restrictive. If you're using this mm -hmm. frequency, someone else can't use it. That doesn't apply to social media. So there's not a. I think there's not a arg like a practical justification for having some licensing scheme there. I mean, the licensing scheme was it was never about the the content necessarily. It was about using the you know, or you know if you're talking about the cable company or the actual phone lines, the actual, there's an infrastructure that is finite, that is, that you're right, is regulated in some way. It's gotten less regulated over time. And you time, have to have a lot of money to do But none of that applies to social media because it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's non-rivalrous. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't exclude anyone else. Twitter existing is not taking up space in the physical universe that is stopping some other expressive platform from existing. It's just market competition. If people like one mm -hmm. more than the other, they're going to use one more than the other. So it lends itself, I think, to an even more pure First Amendment kind of ethos where there is not a, a, a way for the government to intrude. And then, of course, there's just the law is slightly different. The law for Internet companies, Section 230, yeah. is an extremely broad protection of the platform, of the owners of the company, to have whatever speech policies they want. And people on the right sometimes don't like them. People on the left sometimes don't like them. People in the middle sometimes don't like them. But the law says that's your problem because they can set whatever policies they want and they are not liable for the for what happens um, in terms of the speech on the platform. And I actually think that's good, because if that would ch was changed, they would have tremendous incentive to do much more aggressive moderation, and I don't want that. I just wish that uh, Elon Musk in particular, Mr. Free, free Speech Absolutist. Mr. Free Speech himself. Would follow his own values. And if he is a free speech absolutist, why doesn't he become a media company? And why doesn't he operate what like... What is a media company? It isn't, though. It's, it's a tech it company. and you know, It's he, a conservative media company. But it's it, it, <laughs> Let's not be honest. a newspaper. That's what it is. It's, it's definitely conservative. Well, it's a conspiratorial media company. I wouldn't say that. I would say it's a conservative I, media company, but one where... Okay, but like, if we think of CNN as a liberal media company... I don't um, see CNN as a liberal. Oh, well, you should. As, uh, if, I think of CNN as a liberal... Com, uh, uh, liberal media company with very little dissent from a liberal bottom line present within the company. Uh, Twitter is a conservative media company where there is tons of dissent, where there, because you can, again, you can find dissenting content. You can find content from other media organizations on the platform. I, is it skewing right wing increasingly since Elon took it over? Yes, I do, I do think so. Um, but it's still more balanced than just about any other media company you can come across. I don't agree. I mean, we're not really dealing with the best uh, batch of, <laughs> of folks to defend. There's really nobody to defend right now, social media wise. I mean, Blue Sky is not it right now. Uh, Threads is just my Instagram feed on a Twitter. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Like I follow cooks and you know yoga teachers on Instagram, and now suddenly I'm reading their political beliefs and going, mm, "That's a little interesting." Oh, Threads. Yeah, that was never going to work. You, and it's not in real time. Like what? Yeah, Let's just I, complain about all of them right now. Yeah, I, I've, I, th that was a bad idea. That we would be interested in hearing 
more political views from the kinds of people you follow on Instagram. No, you follow people on Instagram because they're your friends or, or your family. And that we would be interested in hearing more political views from the kinds of people you follow on Instagram. No, you follow people on Instagram because they're your friends or, or your family and you want to see the nice photos they pick or you follow celebrities because of fashion trends or entertainment or whatever you know I I don't want to hear more about what they have to actually say about things and it's not real time too which is yeah. the utility of Twitter Stupid when it was idea. at its best was this place to go when there was a breaking story or a live event or something happening in your community where you could go like hashtag you know uh, Capitol Hill DC okay there's always stuff on Capitol but picking your little neighborhood mm -hmm. um, and you know looking it democratized our experience with celebrities and with uh, reporters that, you know, you get in a fight with a New York Times reporter and it was really fun and you, you really could expand their, uh, uh, beyond their column and go into more conversation with them. And it's just not that space now. It's this outrage machine. Um, there's a lot of like bullying and targeting and people don't even realize they're, they're, being, they're being played. Um, this psychological torture game that's occurring on Twitter, and Elon. Well, I don't know if it's as bad as all that. I don't. Well, you're not a woman on Twitter. Mm. I could tweet out, "I like donuts right now," and let me tell you the hate that I would get for that. I mean, I, I get some hate. I get some. Not, hate. not as much. I don't you know. Should play a game. <laughs> Bobby and Nomi tweet the same exact thing. And well, then we'll respond. Get, I, okay, I, I'm not gonna because I just don't do this in general because I'm not a woe is me type person. About I'm. We're in the media, I can take it, it's fine. But, you know, I, in the past with my other uh, co-hosts, if like a clip from the show has been somehow taken, usually not from our own purposes, but yeah. by a high profile account who happens to disagree with me, gets posted on, usually it's elsewhere, like on Instagram or something. I've gotten, I've gotten some hate <laughs> in the past, it's, it's, it does happen. But uh, I, I take your, your, your point or your word for it that I'm sure you faced worse, and that's not good, and everyone should send less vile, awful, hateful, threatening messages to people. It's not cool. Take Don't a breath, guys. Go outside, get some fresh air, touch yeah. the grass. Remember you're human. Human after all. More rising right after this. Netflix account cancellation skyrocketed just days after Netflix co-founder and chairperson Reed Hastings endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris and donated millions to her campaign in July, according to a new report. Netflix has the lowest rate of cancellations in the streaming industry, but its rate tripled after the endorsement, according to the researcher Antenna. Customers canceled by 2.8% in July, a higher rate than any other month since February. Hastings, who is a longtime Democratic donor, endorsed Harris in a post on X on July 23rd, saying, Congrats to Kamala Harris. Now it is time to win. The next day, Hastings said he donated $7 million to a pro-Harris super PAC. It was not long after that, people began posting photos on X showing that they had canceled their Netflix accounts, tweeting the hashtag, cancel Netflix. Is this go woke, go broke all over again? I think it might be. They are going to resubscribe. It's like one of those They're going to resubscribe? It's totally going to happen. And also, it's such a small number. I just find it hilarious because you look at the people who've endorsed Donald Trump, Bill Ackman, Mark Andreessen, uh, John Paulson. There's a list of, like, Rebecca Mercer, uh, Logan Paul. I mean, the list of folks that endorse CEOs, uh, the Winklevoss twins, I mean, uh, Petroleum, Go Southern Energy CEO. Uh, there's so many Yeah, CEOs. I mean, there's a lot of rich people that have endorsed Kamala Harris. There well. are, but not as many. And companies. And we're not saying, like, guess what? We're no longer going to be using your oil and gas, uh, CEO George Bishop of Go Southern, Geo Southern I mean, I mean, Energy. But progressives are, like, chaining themselves to the, to the tanker to not, say, don't drill here. What do you mean? That's different. They're actually disrupting things. They're not disrupt. Oh, I wish they were disrupting Donald Trump's campaign. No, they're, a lot of folks are, are steering their energy in directions when mm -hmm. it's off-season, as we like to say. Uh, but right now, no one's saying we're going to cancel blah, blah, blah because you've endorsed, you know, Donald Trump. Uh, John Paulson's a hedge fund manager. He owns a bunch of hotels, especially in Puerto Rico. I, I am very familiar with him. He's a big activist fighting for those tax breaks where any American can go move to Puerto Rico and not pay taxes if they live there for part Hell of the yeah. year. But if displacing the that. island at a record rate, it's risen the housing costs 600 percent. It's a Trump move. But you know what? People stay, stay in their hotels. Democrats stay in their hotels. Progressives stay in oh, their hotels. Oh, if we'd like to keep people here, we can uh, lower their taxes. <laughs> seems like the way to keep people from uh, fleeing. Um, but you won't be able to. perfectly fine you know, to me. But um, we complain about FEMA not doing their jobs. I love how everyone's complaining. The right is complaining about FEMA not coming in in North Carolina and Florida, and yet these are the same folks who don't want to pay taxes. 
Listen, I'm for lower taxes of the middle class. But I mean, they want taxes. John Paulson they doesn't their, need a tax break. Uh, fair enough. They, they want their taxes to pay for the maintenance of American civilization and not to pay for the militaries of Ukraine and Israel. I That's think we could definitely want, uh, lower our military budget by far and get rid of yeah, the defense contractors and the revolving door. We could fire all the IRS agents. Oh, we could on. eliminate the education department. We can go full Project 2025. Not full Project 2025 because <gasps> I don't agree with everything in it, but I agree with <laughs> a lot of it. And uh, we could reduce the size and scope of our federal government and we could uh, good times could be here again. That's neither here nor there. Look, people don't want, um, and, and look, this was just his private donation, so I don't care. I'm not canceling my Netflix account. Um, although I will say there's not anything on Netflix that I'm really interested in watching right now. Exactly. Netflix is the least of my, I, I have them all. Netflix is the streaming service I'm using the least right now. Um, I guess there's not, I'm catching up on The Boys. That's on, what, Prime, and I'm watching, it's like this is a superhero show. Oh, okay. Um, and the second season of the Lord of the Rings show, which is not very good, unfortunately. It, it's okay. Uh, that's on Prime. Um, I watch a lot of HBO because I fall asleep to old episodes of Rick and Morty. Um, and I just like HBO. Uh, so, yeah, not a lot of Netflix. You're not a Love is Blind fan? There's a new season coming out. We were no. just talking about it before we came on. It's in the D.C. area. <laughs> Everyone so is finally, talking about this. Finally, Love is Blind. What's the, uh, explain the premise of the show. It's an experiment. I don't watch it. Social any of these. experiment. Um, it's very flawed. They definitely have had a lot of pushback recently from former guests uh, who filed a lawsuit against them for uh, giving them, you know, putting the guests. It's a dating show. Okay. So the premise is it's a dating show. Uh, the you're not allowed to see the person you're dating, and you're put into these uh, these quads, right? These little rooms where you're talking through a filter, and you're getting to know the person. You're playing all these games, and you're asking them deep questions. But there's also a lot of alcohol involved, and the hours are really long, and they were draining people, and then they send them out on these trips when they do meet each other, and it's just a recipe mm. for reality spiciness. But it also uh, led to a lot of really difficult situations. They didn't pre-screen some people who had some troubled backgrounds, they put people in very uncomfortable positions. So it's a flawed show. But my mm -hmm. biggest complaint as a viewer was just the age of, of the folks on the show. They were A lot of them are in their early 20s. I'm not marrying anybody that I was dating in my early 20s or <laughs> frankly early 30s or like last week. <laughs> but it's a lot more interesting, I think, and I think a lot of viewers have expressed this. If it's a slightly older demographic who takes things seriously, it can still be energetic and fun and really creative. And I think that they should bring them to the cities, too. I mean, there's a lot of, of cities that they've been picking in middle America. No, no insults against that. But there is a different level of dating when you're in New York or DC or Los Angeles. I think it's a little it's crazier. A lot horrible. No, it's crazy. It's, it's great more TV. So a lot more so. Big fan of Netflix. <laughs> uh, I don't watch a lot of reality TV anymore. I used to very religiously, very regularly watch Survivor, although I stopped several seasons ago. Is that still although, on? It, it is, and actually, what I've heard, what I've come to understand, is they've now started having podcast hosts on Survivor. Um, some of the uh, the uh, Pod Save America bros were, I think, on it. So, just, you know, CBS, if we've started recruiting um, youtube -y podcast type people to be on the show, I would love to be on. I had applied to be on many, many times. So, you know, don't, you can find my contact information on the internet, casting people sur for Survivor. I will do it. I'd be, I'd be happy to play. What one would I be on? I mean, I would like to be on Love is Blind, but I don't really want to be on Love is Blind. I don't want to be on anything that reveals, like, my personal side. I would I would like a competition show like that. Maybe Survivor's it. My producer just said this show is like Survivor. And uh, I've done pretty well, huh, so far? <laughs> more rising. More. <laughs> I've won or lost. That's, that's indeed the, the case. More rising right after this. Last week, several whistleblowers came forward to testify to the Environmental Protection Agency's investigation and potential manipulation of data collection regarding chemical contamination in East Palestine, Ohio, following the 2023 derailment. Scott Smith has previously revealed dangerous levels of dioxins and ferns in the town's air, water, soil, and homes, which counters the EPA narrative that it is, in fact, safe to live in East Palestine. That's what they say. While EPA staffers have tried to discredit Smith, a new filing from Stephen Petty substantiates Smith's findings. Petty argues that the claim of no long-term health impacts is premature and speculative due to the lack of human health assessment studies that have been conducted in East Palestine. And in other East Palestine news, settlement checks related to the disastrous derailment could now be delayed up to two years because of an appeal of a, a federal judge's decision to approve the $600 million deal. 
Many in East Palestine, uh, res many East Palestine residents are understandably outraged by the news. Some had planned to use the money to relocate from the community that had hazardous chemicals spread throughout it. The plaintiff's attorneys had hoped to start sending the checks out by the end of the year, but now the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals will first have to wrestle with whether the deals offer enough compensation. The plaintiff's attorney said, quote, we will do everything in our power to quickly resolve this appeal and prevent any further burdens on the residents and local businesses that want to move forward and rebuild their lives. Residents posting on a Facebook group accused the pastor, Reverend Joseph Sheely, who filed the appeal of being greedy. Joining us now to discuss it all is Government Accountability Project whistleblower Scott Smith. Hey, Scott. Thanks for joining us. Hey, uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So uh, this is wild that uh, the checks could be delayed up to two years because of a challenge. Meanwhile, residents are still living in what is likely uh, very unhealthy circumstances in the community of East Palestine and putting themselves at risk. So in Yeah, well, the... Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, I'm not so sure what's true and not true on social media, um, so I can't speak to that. But I've been very clear from day one. I've been there 27 times, 31 trips over the last year and a half, comprehensive testing, that it's not my position or anybody I'm working with to recommend opting in, opting out. I'm for transparency. I'm for residents to have full information. And uh, what has happened, as you can see in the latest press release from Government Accountability Project, the EPA, Norfolk Southern, and now joined by the plaintiff's attorneys, um, have orchestrated quite a smear campaign. And the, in the, it, at a very high level, the bottom line is, if there's nothing to see here, why were the plaintiff's attorneys withholding Stephen Petty's results? It just doesn't make any sense. So transparency and information from the plaintiff's attorneys in the court, in my opinion, could clear this all up. What are they hiding is the question. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the government's position. So the EPA says it's perfectly safe. You can drink the water. It's fine. There's no evidence to the contrary. What, why is that not something that should be accepted at face value? Uh, great question, and we have evidence that is voluminous that, that the EPA is a completely corporate captured agency, and the EPA has been used as a front for Norfolk Southern um, and the, what I call the incestuous revolving door of, like, for example, the plaintiff's attorney, uh, the Norfolk Southern attorney used to be an, a Davina Pujara, ex-EPA attorney, that tried to intimidate me and subpoena in my driveway. The, what you will see in my recent sworn declaration, along with Stephen Petty's and my 629 pages of exhibits, the EPA is manipulating and altering data, removing data that they have in their possession that is Norfolk Southern to promote a narrative of nothing to see here. It, and, and I have an expression, you can't find what you don't look for. And I plan to go out there twice, and it, it, it came it became you know 27 trips and 31 rounds of testing because the EPA and Norfolk Southern refused to test near ground zero. And I want to just uh, add for context: 52% of my results say nothing to see here. About 48% have identified hot zones, in hot zones where you have elevated levels uh, above um, industry accepted screening levels. Uh, for follow-up, and, and the EPA has refused to test in these same locations. That's why the community reached out to me. I mean, it just it doesn't take a genius to realize that there are most likely some sort of health uh, risks living in the community after this, this horrible event occurred. When you say that the EPA has been tethered to corporate interests, including North Fork Southern, can you explain a little bit more about that relationship and how you were able to conclude that? Yeah, um, because it comes from um, a lot of evidence where the EPA will publicly tell the public and the media that uh, uh, that they are overseeing Norfolk Southern. But we've uncovered through Freedom of Information Act requests where it's clear that Norfolk Southern is saying, you know, the EPA is saying they will not communicate with any contractors. They will go through Norfolk Southern on everything. And we also have recently... Uh, and this is in my sworn declaration, the EPA withholding Norfolk Southern data because they say they can't release Norfolk Southern data. So that is completely counter to the EPA telling the public they are in charge uh, and they're a transparent organization and they're, and they're basically managing Norfolk Southern. In their own words, they're caught. 
You said they tried to intimidate you because of your outspokenness and trying to shed a light on this. What exactly have they done to try to get you to be to, to shut up about what's going on in East Palestine? Yeah, uh, there's a whole network of ex EPA uh, employees, attorneys that have sold out their fellow Americans, and specifically in my driveway in Massachusetts, I received a subpoena from Norfolk Southern from ex EPA attorney Duvina Pajara, who sold out and now works for the Norfolk Southern attorneys. They wanted all my communications with media, all my private communications with residents about testing, all my detailed backup and a complete violation of my constitutional rights. That's why I have government accountability project. And, and, th and this is all documented, clearly laid out. So we now live in an age where the corporate interests control the federal agency and anybody that doesn't toe the line in the narrative you attempt to intimidate them and silence them. And, and, and the recent thing is the plaintiff's attorneys were talking just like me as late as January 26, 2024. Then all of a sudden a settlement gets announced and they changed their narrative. They actually hired a PR firm, as you can see in the government accountability press release, the plaintiff's attorneys joined the EPA. They hired a PR firm to smear and attack me. And what they didn't see coming is their own expert, Stephen Petty, come forward with a sworn declaration vindicating me, saying that my methods are sound. So what did Stephen Petty say to validate uh, what, what, you've, what you've uncovered? And, um, and, and if you can, go a little bit more into depth about what you did uncover over the years and the several uh, times that you've visited yeah. East Palestine. I what, what basically, I'd refer you to the sworn declaration. I don't have it memorized, obviously, off the top of my head, but that my methods are valid, uh, the way I do testing. And I'm also using Eurofin's independent lab, the same lab used by Norfolk Southern, the same lab used by EPA. And the fact is, um, the EPA refused to sit down with me and share detailed test results and reciprocity. Because I was all for, even though I'm a private citizen, I was willing to do that. Now that these other documents have come out, we know why the EPA only wanted a one-way direction from a private citizen, because they were withholding information and deceptively manipulating data. Mm. Incredible. Scott Smith, thank you so much for joining us to shed light on this subject. Thank you for having me. For any drinkers out there, you might want to stock up on booze now because the strike spanning 14 ports in the U.S. could affect liquor imports within the month. Union dock workers up and down the East and Gulf Coast began striking earlier Monday. Workers hit the picket lines just after midnight. More than $2 billion worth of merchandise, including cars, clothing, farm machinery, and more, are at a standstill after negotiations between the International Longshoremen's Association and the United States Maritime Alliance, representing ocean carriers and port operators, broke down. Dock workers are demanding better wages and automation. The Biden administration has stood firm on letting these negotiations play out. President Biden on Sunday told reporters that he doesn't believe in Taft-Hartley, a federal law that allows the president to step in and call for an 80-day cooling period when there's a national security risk. Republicans and over 170 industry groups have already warned a prolonged strike could have significant ramifications on the U.S. economy, especially ahead of the holiday season. Trade groups penned a letter to Biden saying, quote, it is imperative that the parties return to the table without engaging in disruptive activities that could harm the economy and the millions of businesses, workers, and consumers who rely on the seamless flow of goods, both imports and exports, through our East Coast and Gulf Coast ports. Some companies have made contingency plans to offset potential economic impacts, for example, rerouting cargo to the West Coast in anticipation of the work stoppage. But some acknowledge that only so much can be done. Hmm. This is a lot. I mean, I was just looking at the numbers. Half of all cargo coming into the United States, that's one million, uh, one million uh, what's it called, uh, uh, boxes. Tons. What do they call it? Tons. Tons, whatever. The cargo, the cargo uh, crates that come in are going to be at risk. And then three quarters of all containers going out are at risk. So this is a significant portion of the docks, 14 docks as stated. The largest docks in America are still on the West Coast, Los Angeles being the largest. Um, so rerouting it would be quite a bit of a reroute. 
We remember what happened with the Suez Canal when there was that breakdown with one ship stuck in the Suez Canal and how that affected supply chain all over yes, the world. Yes, we've all become more knowledgeable about disruptions to the supply chains and mm -hmm. how that can have devastating effects. Um, you know, at a time where Americans, the, the thing that they're most concerned about is the cost of goods, the what they're paying at the grocery store, what they're paying for goods and services. Um, I think this is a very... Uh, awful potential economic catastrophe looming on the horizon. Um, it's interesting that Biden does have the authority to do something about it under the law and has said that he does not recognize that authority and will not uh, exercise it. Do you think that will be something that is appreciated by voters in the upcoming election? I think it is. it could be an October surprise. I don't know if they'll feel it right away because sometimes these situations play out. It takes a few weeks, a few months. Uh, inflation is down, but it doesn't mean it's going to be reduced. The rate is down right now, but a lot of Americans aren't feeling that because things are still expensive and wages haven't gone up. So you already have this economic vibe happening in this country, and credit card debt is at, up. But yes, the stock market's doing better, the meta economy is great. You already have these issues as voters are thinking about them going into the election. Maybe just the conversation about this, even though it may not be impacting their wallets just yet, will impact a few, uh, a few voters' minds, especially in those swing states. And listen, Biden does have the ability as the, the union president to stand with you know, union leaders and, and push back against these big companies. He does have the ability to help be some sort of negotiator in peace. Don't forget, he showed up on the, on the picket lines in the past. He did pressure um, companies in the past to, to move a little bit, especially if it's going to hurt their bottom line, too. I mean, companies must be thinking, how much money are we going to lose by rerouting everything? How much money are we going to lose uh, facing the longshore shoremen, which is a very strong union. You may recall, uh, in 1934, they had a massive strike. And it was one of the most impactful strikes, strikes in American history. And it changed the way we dealt with labor in this country. On the Waterfront, which won a, a, an award, an Academy Award, Aaliyah Kazan, one of the greatest movies of all time, was about the longshoremen fighting back against mob bosses. And there was a murder. And I highly recommend folks who see it. So the, this is a union that has a legacy of really standing with their workers when they do it. It's just the timing could not be worse. And how does that affect labor across the country if, for instance, this union might be a bad narrative for Democrats and suddenly they get Donald Trump as a president? Are they going to be regretting striking now versus, say, in a month or two? One of the uh, biggest changes I would like to see that's somewhat related to this issue would be a repeal of the Jones Act, which makes I agree with you on this. just massively more expensive. Um, the estimates are that we lose somewhere between 20 and $60 billion a year because we are required under a law from, what, 1920s? that ships, doing shipping in between ports that are both ports are in the United States, the ship, it must be a ship that was built in America. So this just massively raises the cost of everything. It's a, especially bad for Puerto Rico. Um, and in fact, they suspend this law every time there's a disaster in Puerto Rico because they recognize that, oh, that now we can't afford, well, we can't afford to have it any time. We could at any time suspend it and get the economic benefits from allowing what our whatever the most efficient use of shipping would be to move goods from one place to the other instead of artificially saying it has to be made in America. So the Jones Act has been so restrictive to the people of Puerto Rico, and I've covered it. I was there um, for several hurricanes, and after Hurricane Maria, of course, it wasn't just that Puerto Ricans didn't have lights and water. And by the way, they're still deal dealing with power outages to this day, and they're concerned about it for this election even. It's that the goods, they, they, it's been so restrictive. The American companies came in, the sugar companies, came in and stripped Puerto Ricans of their land to make them dependent on importing goods from the United States, so much so that the majority of goods that are brought into Puerto Rico are coming from the United States because of the Jones Act. But what happens in the case of a hurricane is that if, the, if power is not on and you need oil um, to run gas generators, which is the situation, those ships sit on the dock right there, and you're staring at them on the island, and they can't come in because of the Jones Act. And so in- It's really stupid. It's, 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 it's not just a prohibitive cost for Puerto Ricans. Goods are more expensive on the island. They're almost as expensive, if not the same, as goods on the island of Manhattan. A completely different scenario, right? But the cost of living there has gone up while people are being displaced, while these tax breaks are, are, are there, um, bringing in folks, rich folks from, from the outside. And then on top of it, you know, a gallon of milk is like twice the price. And it's not fresh. So the produce you see there is not fresh because it's being shipped in. Sometimes they'll even grow it on the island of Puerto Rico, ship it to Florida, and then it's shipped back because that's how restrictive this law is. Yep. The Jones Act is so ancient, and 
I'm incredibly pro-labor, but I definitely have an issue with labor when it comes to the Jones Act. And I think the people of Puerto Rico right. agree with that, too. It is overwhelmingly uh, popular to well, we end the Jones Act. That. Because laborers, I mean, I'm also pro-labor, but laborers are also uh, consumers of food exactly. and supplies. So raising prices for everyone is not a good strategy. So this is why you can never believe the government when, or politicians when they say, no, we're doing everything to make the economy better. We're doing everything to keep prices down. You're not doing everything, because this is a pretty simple thing that could be changed that's never, never changed. It's a shame. Uh, well, we'll continue following this, uh, this strike, see if it comes to fruition. Um, I would expect that Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, maybe J.D. Vance and Tim Walls are going to get a lot of questions about this uh, coming up or rising. Since the former face of NBC Nightly News, Brian Williams, left his show at MSNBC, he's now in talks to make a major return for Amazon Prime Video. Per Variety's Brian Sternberg, Williams is in active discussions with Amazon Prime Video to anchor an election night special. If that deal goes through, it'd be Amazon's first push into live, live news after years of saying it wouldn't go into the news. The LA Times reports Amazon's entry into live news coverage will be a scary move for the legacy TV, TV networks struggling to maintain financial footing, with nearly every news operation looking to cut costs after the 2024 election. As a reminder, Williams angered NBC Nightly News from 2004 to 2015 after admitting to misrepresenting his experience covering the 2003 Iraq War, he received a six-month suspension and was eventually demoted. In 2015, Williams said he had previously traveled in an aircraft hit by two rocket-propelled grenades. He later admitted that was false after being called out by members of the air crew. Williams insisted it was an accident and he had conflated one aircraft with another in his mind. Can journalists be rehabilitated? Look, I'm all for rehabilitation and forgiveness, but he did a lot wrong over the course of his career. A lot of serial exaggerations. It's not just the time he said that the aircraft he was in got hit by a rocket. Um, he also claimed he was there when the Berlin Wall came down. He actually arrived the next day, the, the night it came down. He wasn't. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, he said he flew to Baghdad with SEAL Team 6, and then the spokesperson for SEAL Team 6 said, yeah, actually, we don't embed journalists. Uh, he, uh, my favorite is Malcolm Gladwell on his podcast decided to sort of give him a little bit of redemption, saying, well, the human mind works a certain way, and sometimes we conflate memories. And it, but that was just about that one Iraq war uh, being shot down. Well, and that is true. Helicopter. We do conflate. Yeah. The human memory does work that way. Um, we, this is why eyewitness testimony is, is more, um, less reliable than you'd expect. Different people will remember different events different ways. And we remember things in ways that are favorable to us because we're uh, motivated. First person to be, syndrome. Yeah, to be... <laughs> Uh, to, to characterize events most favorable to us. And we remember things that are most memorable to us. So that's all true. But like the job of a journalist is to circumvent that by uh, keeping good notes, um, sticking to your script of verifiable information. Don't just spout off on things you don't remember that happened a long time ago. Refresh yourself. Reread the notes you took at the time or the stories you wrote at the time. Yeah, it can happen to all of us that we you know, misremember in our long careers something we wrote about or said or participated in a long time ago, but you should just you know, have the, be professional enough to, to look back and then to, to get it right and to correct when you make a mistake, because we all do make mistakes. But this is a long history of him doing this. Um, I, I'm not sure why they're turning to him, just because he's a comforting, calming presence or face for some people for... I Maybe he was the cheapest bid. Middle-aged women, I don't know. I can't get over the fact... Maybe he was the cheapest bid. <laughs> Seriously. I just can't get over the fact that... You... I would do it for cheaper than him, I'm going to guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't supposedly uh, shot down in a helicopter. But like, I've never made you... that claim. I, was he conflating what SEAL Team 6 went through when they were shot down in a helicopter? Yeah. I, I think you would remember, you know, coming out of the fire and running and... What on earth? That is not a fabrication. That's not conflation. That is... That is wildly, like, nuts, especially knowing that you're in the news world and you're going to be fact-checked at some point. I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner, but, you know, the Internet and it has empowered a lot of folks uh, to finally check some of their heroes. I just... It, it, you have a really good agent, Brian Williams, because whoever's getting you back on, and they got some money. They got a lot of money, so Amazon. Mm. It's kind of interesting that Amazon wants to do live coverage of the presidential um, election. I would say there's... 
already enough of that. It's a crowded meco media ecosystem. There's uh, no shortage of uh, news coverage. Um, there's certainly no shortage of establishment corporate media news coverage. Um, if that's what you're into, there are a lot of competitors already, so I don't know why they find that so valuable. Of course, we are all moving to a streaming economy, and the number of people who just have their TV on and just have it you know, tuned in to CNN or MSNBC or whatever is uh, dwindling somewhat. That tends to be older Americans, older Americans who have the news on all the time, whereas everybody else is looking for streaming. So I, I guess I can see it as a as a possibility, and, and the, the forays into streaming that companies like CNN have done not gone so well. Not we so all well. remember CNN Plus. Yes, <laughs> now they just put CNN on. Although I did see news from today that CNN is planning to paywall uh, the website for some users. Did you see this? It just yeah. got announced this morning. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. It's a big announcement from CNN itself that uh, they're launching a digital paywall requiring some readers to pay $3.99 a month for unlimited access to the stories. Um, you'll get it if you're only like occasionally checking in, you're going to get it for free, but for everyone else it's going to be $3.99 per month or $29.99 per year. And uh, starting so here's a statement from CNN. Starting today we're asking users in the United States to pay a small recurring fee from limited access. The vast majority of the 150 million users who visit CNN will continue to enjoy the same experience as they do today. Only after users consume a certain number of free articles will they be prompted to subscribe. So this is like the paywall for the New York Times or any of other media companies. But what's interesting It's hard to get people who pay, who used to getting something for free to pay for it. 100%. That's what I think. And it's restrictive, you know, if, if, if you want people to be more informed, and CNN, I think, has an agenda to do so and keep their brand going, I understand the business model is difficult for many of these media companies. Scripps News is shutting down. Uh, that just came out that they've had to cut 200 jobs, and now they're shutting down. Uh, but what's interesting about this model is the Washington Post is a legacy media publication that Jeff Bezos owns, the founder of Amazon. And I'm curious if, if there's just an ecosystem now where he can rely on Washington Post and they don't have to be fearful of their budget because it's it's Jeff Bezos and Amazon money, which is like endless and endless and endless. It may actually be a good thing in that news is being finally funded by some other entity that's not necessarily the traditional mm. means of subscription only or, I mean, that, we know that with Amazon streaming, it's not profitable. Unlike Netflix, which has to reconfigure all of their different schemes to get people to pay more each month or... Um, or these other platforms, like I pay for Hulu already, and then I realize I have to pay for Hulu Plus or Live to watch other shows, and right. it's getting confusing. It is I getting like... confusing, right. I have Disney Plus, so I have Hulu, yeah. but I have to go into Disney to get it because I still have the Hulu app from when I just had Hulu. If you click on that, it says you don't have it. It's the, the bundling. I know. You need like an, I need an efficiency expert to tell me where I say, these are all the things I want, and then they say, okay, these are the services you actually need because I'm willing to pay for them. It's just you end up paying for double or triple it was what you worry about because of how the bundling works. It's starting to get confusing. It's super confusing, and of course Amazon's going to take advantage of that and say, guess what? Uh, you pay for Amazon Prime, you get all this stuff. Yeah. You can you know, watch the, the television shows and the movies, and maybe sometimes you have to pay for a movie, but you also can buy your cheap goods, like your, your Timu-level cheap goods on Amazon. But that's who they're competing with. They're not competing with other yeah. streamers and Netflix. They're competing with Timus and Sheens and yeah. the companies overseas who are offering it for much cheaper. I have purchased from Timu a couple times. Oh, no. I have. Um, you know, it's You're listening to your conversations right now. I guess so. Oh well. I mean, what are we listening to my conversations? You can please just <laughs> go to YouTube to and do so. <laughs> just do it the proper way. Click. <laughs> Click the button, like, share, subscribe, share a video, listen, watch. Uh, I am meant to be China, listened to. Just like and subscribe. That's all we do. Meant to be listened to. More rising right after this. Radio show host Charlemagne the God applauded a Trump campaign ad that aired during NFL football games over the weekend. That ad highlighted Vice President Kamala Harris's previous support for taxpayer-funded surgeries for transgender inmates. For context, in 2019, Harris explained her support, saying, quote, It is important that transgender individuals who rely on the state for care receive the treatment they need, which includes access to treatment associated with gender transition. Here's Charlemagne's reaction to that ad. Let's watch. That ad they was running during oh, the football man. games this weekend claiming the vice president supports funding gender transition surgeries for all prison inmates and migrants in the U.S. That was nuts. That, that I was. Don't, I don't know if it I was. I wouldn't say nuts, but nuts. that was crazy. Was, that, was, that was funny. I don't, know, I don't know if it was the <laughs> backdrop of football 
But when you hear the narrator say Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners, that one line, I was like, hell no, I don't want my taxpayer dollars going I to that. I definitely see that. She did that it. ad was effective. Kamala took a picture <laughs> with a transgender. And it was it was just what they were saying that it made it seem like Kamala supports transgender sex changes in jail with our money. That's what it, that's what it came yes, across. Yeah, that, 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 that what they're saying? That yes. Was, yes, it said it literally said uh, that Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes. For prisoners, and it talks about how you know uh, uh, she, she supports funding gender transition surgeries for all prison inmates and migrants in the United States. That ad was impactful. Was I, it like, impactful it was. I'm not gonna lie. I was like, damn. Was it because it was during football? Yes, I think it was doing because it was during football. The, well, but the last saying, week, like the contrast of it. Yes. yes. But the last week they had uh, the same thing running on Tim Walsh and said he likes, likes tampons in boys' bathrooms. I would not oh, have paid boy. that. I don't think I would have paid that commercial no attention if it, it was any other time. But. When, when you're watching football <laughs> and you just mind, you just what? What the hell? In between well, big commercials, they give you this. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to admit that this was a pretty solid hit. Digging up this old questionnaire that Kamala Harris responded to from the ACLU, where she was prompted by the organization to adopt this stance, and she did so quite willingly. It is not. Uh, I think we can all recognize that, even if you, for some reason, happen to agree with it. I do not think it is a politically popular stance. I think it is one that has made her quite vulnerable to say specifically that um, inmates, criminals, should have their um, sex change operations or whatever it is paid for by the state. I would further uh, wonder whether some of them might not. This is not at all, in my view, a ridiculous scenario where someone um, who's going to be in prison for a long time would seek this kind of treatment in order to get into the women's prison instead of the men's prison, which is much safer than men's prisons in, in many cases um, for the, the lot of violence and stabbing and things. I mean, that happens in women's prisons too, but it is much safer environment. Um, I can imagine that uh, absolutely happening, and I guess taxpayers will be paying for it. I think there's the issue, right? There's the policy, which is never accurately portrayed through media. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the tactic. The tactic here reminds me of Lee Atwater's tactics, the famous uh, conservative uh, ad maker who worked with Roger Ailes in the early uh, the, the 80s and early 90s. And there was that ad against Michael Dukakis, a very famous Willie Horton ad, uh, which painted him as, 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 as really being horrible on crime. And they ran it in certain states, and that's what effective ads do. I don't love that Charlemagne the God is covering this. He's saying it's a great ad, and he supports Kamala Harris, and he speaks to a group of black men in particular right now that are, are a bit more conservative when it comes to cultural issues. And I just found it odd that, like, it's one thing to talk about an ad, it's nothing to praise it. And the ad was effective, and it is, well, we don't know actually until the polls come, until, until mm -hmm. polls come out, but it is targeting a group of folks that Kamala Harris is really trying to peel a few off of. She, she wants to bring a few men who might be down the center, who might not like Trump, to get off their couch and vote for her. And what Donald Trump is doing is appealing to those same men and saying, stay on the couch because she's nuts. That's what that's the game they're playing right now. They're each trying to get a, a percentage here of, of men down the center uh, who are undecided. And he doesn't want to win Kamala voters over. He's just trying to get potential Kamala voters to stay home hmm. because he has a cap. He has a cap of MAGA supporters, people who are financially interested in Donald Trump, and he's losing these Never Trumpers. And she is trying to gain a few of the Never Trumpers because it's about her getting to a certain point in, in the polls in each of these swing states uh, that she can overcome him. And it's an effective ad, and as was the other one against Tim Wallace was an effective ad. We got to get better at that. It can't just be about abortion, which is very important and will definitely motivate people to go to the polls. It has to be about countering these narratives, which they're skewering all of her politics. That's what you do in politics, right? People have voting records. Sometimes you sign pledges. Sometimes, you know, the ads won't get into specifics. It's a much more complicated issue. But that's what good political ad makers do, is they sit there and they take maybe an ounce of an opinion you had and turn it into an ad targeting you in those weak areas. Kamala Harris could, of course, neutralize the issue by just saying that she no longer supports that policy. She's done this on fracking. She's done this on decriminalizing the border. She's done this on a whole host of very unpopular, far-left, culturally progressive type uh, stances she felt compelled to adopt when she ran for president in uh, 2019. She could do so uh, here. In fact, she's shown no hesitance to, to shake it off, shake off her uh, past support for things that are 
extremely unpopular. So I guess it's telling if she doesn't choose to do that here that she stands by it and thinks this is a, I guess, very important issue to keep in your campaign portfolio. The uh, taxpayer fund, again, if they want to pay for it themselves, that's fine, but the taxpayers will pay for uh, this level of, uh, of uh, of care for uh, for inmates. I don't think she wants to call attention to it. I think that if you're well, I know she doesn't want to call attention to it. Well, it's also more complicated, right? So she, if she's explaining, she's losing. That's an old rule in in, in the political world. Yeah. If you're explaining, you're losing. On fracking, that has to do with the key portion of voters that do vote on that issue because it because their, their jobs, jobs depend in, on it in Pennsylvania. So you know, there's reasons and there's national security implications and and uh, obviously wanting to get off of foreign oil. Uh, there are plenty of aspects to fracking and why she reversed her positioning which I don't agree with, but I understand what her mindset was behind that. This is not something she wants to bring up and get into the weeds about because now we're going into a cultural debate and most voters aren't really voting on trans issues. It might annoy someone enough, they want to keep the negatives up there with Kamala Harris that they decide, you know what, I just don't think she is what I want to vote for, but I'm not going to vote for Trump. Yeah, That's I mean, the strategy. It, it is, it's not just a cultural issue, again, if it's being taxpayer funded, right? I, I don't care what other people do with their uh, bodily autonomy, with their Mm -hmm. you know, make whatever choices you want, um, but do do we all have to pay for it? Is I mean, we're paying a lot of money to keep people in jail right now, uh, That's true. many of whom probably don't deserve to be in jail. So if you want to have a greater conversation about funding the prison industrial complex and taxpayers funding it, I would love mm -hmm. to have the conversation. To be in jail. And we'll agree. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll agree on, I, I would release nonviolent drug offenders, certainly. Um, although there's a lot of people who do need to be locked up. And Kamala Harris said that she would go further than uh, Joe Biden when it comes to marijuana, and she would push to legalize it. I'm entirely. happy for that. We should absolutely do that. It's crazy. It's not. Uh, it's not legal. I support that. I would like to see more action from Democrats leading on that issue because their ba their base allows them even that much leeway. Although Republican base too thinks. Um, many drugs should be, to at least some extent, decriminalized or decided at the state level. It really doesn't need to be a federal policy, but the feds should not, you know, have it scheduled such that maybe if your state or your locality legalizes it, you could still have the DEA sweep in and arrest everybody. You, nobody wants that threat looming over your head. So just get the federal government out of it and let states that want to experiment with um, uh, laxer laws on this stuff do so. I think that would be great. And it would regulate marijuana. Uh, across the board if it was federalized, which is a big issue between states as you have mm. uh, different levels and different um, different folks taking advantage of growing marijuana and you don't know. I mean, not that I would know because I don't do There's it. There's some strong but stuff out there right now. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's not. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I know, know someone that. who knows. Yeah, yeah we, yeah, we know somebody who knows. <laughs> and I just happen to be holding their stuff right now. No, <laughs> it's my friends. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's fine. Libertarian, I'm all for <laughs> drug legalization. No hypocrisy over here. The DA's right there. That's into the studio. <laughs> uh, they'll never take me alive. <laughs> that does it for us today on Rising. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any of our content. And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we're now available anywhere you can find podcasts. And we'll be back tonight for some special VP debate coverage. And then, of course, we'll be back tomorrow as well. See you then.